Yes. I'd like to shout out to Don Sinclair and the YouTube channel. Yours truly, Dennis Moval, in a live situation. Hello and welcome to Don Sinclair Reggae Vibes. I'm your host, Leslie Ann Samuel. Known as the Queen of Reggae, Dawn Penn's songs have spanned the globe for generations. Please give it up for Dawn Penn. Hello Dawn. Hi, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for coming in today. Thanks for having me. Um, so what age did you get into music? Um, I grew up in a, a musical family. Um, my dad played some instruments and we had a piano in the house and violin. I think it's about... I started to play a big fiddle with the piano around, say, five or six years old. Okay. Because it was already there in my face. So yeah. you just go on the piano and play something by air until we um, ended up learning to play classical music like Mozart and Chopin and Schubert and Tchaikovsky and Mendelssohn and these type of people. Oh, lovely. So yeah. were they the artists that inspired or, or um, helped you to mould your... No, those are the composers that we had to study their works to oh, play on the piano with sheet music. Right. Yeah. But later on, we um, did exams. We had an exam and it came from the UK, Royal School of Music. Right. And examined us and we picked up our pieces at um, Times Tour in Kingston. Yeah. And studied them and played them in front of him and he would give us marks for how we played so you knew that you would pass, whether you passed the exam for grade one. If you know, it goes mm -hmm. up to grade eight, then you do your degree, LRSM. Okay. So um, I did piano up to up the, the exams on the theory of music and rudiments of music until about grade seven. And then around that time, I started to play the violin because we went to a um, concert and our parents asked us if we wanted to learn the, the violin. And we, all three of us all had a violin and the teacher came into the house on a Saturday to teach us to play the violin. That's lovely. Yeah. And um, what was the first single you brought um, that one is, it happened in such a quirky way. Um, I used to play the piano at Beverly's in their studio where all the people used to go and rehearse. And in between creating songs, I ended up playing a song called When I'm Gonna Be Free. And about 10 years roughly ago, I found out it was a record selling on eBay on auction for oh. 1,761 pounds. Wow. To be honest, yeah. that's when I knew that was a record. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, around 1967 was when I officially did um, my first recording for Prince Buster. And I also did You Don't Love Me, No, No, No for Coxon. That was a huge selling track. Yeah. Um, talk to us about what actually inspired you to, to write No, No, No. Um, it's all about lost love, you know. Um, we were living in a different time and age where people officially really did love people. It's not a game and it's not whatever you call that word right now. Like some people's mentality, you have 25 and 26 ladies and whatever, whatever. It yeah. was like almost a one-to-one -one thing. Yeah. Um, it was all about lost love, but um, I went to studio one, one afternoon and with my friends and sang this song on Cox and said, come back the next day to record it. That was this Sunday and I came back the Monday and Jackie me too in his lifetime and sat on the piano because I used to sit down beside him. Yeah. Because he played jazz, Jimmy Smith kind of music, so I like jazz a yeah. lot. So we worked out the cards and everything. In fact, in that recording, there's a mistake where the band was supposed to play and change the chords at a certain junction of the song, and they didn't. And it just went on because when you go in the studio at that time, there was nothing to sink in or fly you in or start from where you made a mistake. You had to start from the whole thing. So it just went on. Everything else was good except that particular error. But um, around 2001, he said to me when we were doing the 35-year anniversary, um, if I knew that I did the song twice, he went into his archives and found another version that I did in 1968. Oh, By wow. that time, I'd gone yeah. to sing for Prince Buster already. Yeah. We just follow friends and go to the studios mm. and things. 
I mean, the actual lyrics to No, 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 like you said, it, it, it is, they're quite deep. Was that some, an experience that happened personally to you, or? This is what it yeah. is, a personal experience. So it's just like when it became a hit back from Studio One version and the remake with Steely and Cleaver, that is a worldwide hit. You know, the feedback I get from people who listen to it, even in America, say, um, the song is simple. Even a two-year-old child could probably sing it, mm -hmm. but it's all about how I deliver the song because it's like I'm my gut feeling. And every time I hear it, I say, well, is that really how I sound? Yeah. You know? And um, one time I was in Jamaica, about 2 o'clock in the morning, and I heard some song across from where I live playing this song, and I couldn't believe that was really mm -hmm. how it sounded, to be honest. Because I, haven't, I just know that, remember, we don't get a copy. Yes, yeah. We don't sign any paper. All we want to know is that our names is on the radio. I so, uh, you know, I heard the song that you did, da, 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 da. But, yeah, quite a few people said I wrote the song as well. And they were trying to hook it up with some other songs that didn't make sense. But I just leave them to their own thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that song's been sung over by by many artists, I mean, current artists today. Eve was the first one, really. Mm. But you had Wu-Tang Clan, J Mills. I think they were hooked up with... Wu-Tang Clan was signed to Atlantic when they were signed to Atlantic. OK. Yeah. And um, Wu-Tang Clan, J Mills, Lily Allen, Sean Paul, Rihanna Vibes Cartel, yeah. Beyonce did it in her Japanese tour. Yes. They told me and so forth. It's good. Mm. I'm saying, are they trying to see if they can sing the song better than me, though? No, I don't <laughs> think so. I don't think so. This was the yeah. man. But I know that um, somehow it has a lot. Of, it has longevity. And when they went to market me when I was with Atlantic, they decided to call the album. My manager at the time decided to call the album. No, 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 because it's everybody knew the song. Yeah. So um, it's a learning curve, and it also. It's a university, that particular track. Mm. It put food on my table and it also, I've seen so many countries free of charge yeah, for me. Definitely. <laughs> How long did you spend um, with Atlantic Records? Um, I was signed in 1994 and uh, by 1999, it was an eight year album deal, but some things wasn't going right. You know, when you, you get signed to somewhere and you don't know the intricacies of what to expect or thing it's like the first time something is happening in your life yeah so you don't so know you're like in a dream world mm. but you're going with the flow because the label says this and then the the pr and marketing guy is a guy called dylan powell from jamaica as well okay. and you know i meet up with some label mates i i signed to atlantic because i figured out i met up with people like aretha franklin because she was on that label as well well yeah they're huge but I never did meet her, mm -hmm. but I met Robin S. Okay. And there was another guy from Jamaica that was signed. And I think um, there's another guy from Jamaica. He's doing gospel now who was signed as well before me. Right, right. And when did you leave Atlantic Records? Leave Atlantic Records. Well, they were. It was an eight-year deal, so they were supposed to get one album. They were supposed to get an album every year because that's what the contract said. Right. But you know, like I say, being a newcomer, anything, I know that I have power, but what power have I, I don't know. So mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm supposed to really go to the lawyer and let the lawyer um, make my lawyer read the paperwork and tell me what time it is. Mm -hmm. But it was my manager who was like doing, sorry I have to tell you this, but is it true? No, please. <laughs> this is what the platform is for. It was my for. manager who was talking to these guys for like 45 pounds an hour or something like that at the time. Right. And, um, I just went with him, but I wanted everything to materialize, and I was a bit excited going from East Coast to West Coast twice a week. Well, of course, you're living the dream. I'm living a dream, and the wickedest bit, I worked in the bank, so I had no money, and I can count them, and I yeah. got millions of dollars yeah. a day sometimes. Mm. Um, I used to work on the airlines, which da-da-da-da-da. Right. Okay. Mm. And, um, I mean, what did you expect from the deal? Well, I was looking forward to really giving them what was required. But after the first album, no one came back to say they wanted one. So I asked myself, call up 
the label to find out and the lady said, um, did we say we want another album, blah, blah, blah. So that was the end of that. And then I did a track, I did an album for, um, for Trojan. Right. I was doing a lot of shows, tours, come over here, and then go to Europe for um, 30 shows a month, kind of thing. Okay. Every night you're on stage with Desmond Decker, people like that, and mm. the different people. So, um, yeah, I went to Trojan. This man introduced me to Trojan. I did an album, I co produced it with him, and then um, I decided I was doing singles with some people you know, different collaborations and yeah. so forth. And um, following that, I started to do things on my own. So I started The Beat Limited, which is Dawn's Beat. Okay. Because I just called it The Beat, but I was in the Brad's house in LA right. when the idea came to me and I wrote a song called Chilling because we couldn't find a beach there in the yeah. Bay Area, so that mm. was it. Okay. and. If you could choose one artist to work with today, who would that be? Well, I met so many people at the BET Awards. Mm. Um, well, Miss Badu said she wanted to do something. India Ari yeah. said she wanted to do something. I was trying to work out something with Neo at the time when he did with a song with Pitbull. Um, um, Charlie Wilson also. Um, I still have a lot of faith in John Forte of the Fugees because okay. he has a lot of energy, he's electric, mm. he's electric. You go in the studio and in 15 minutes he can come out with a song. Okay. So that would be the ideal person that you would like he to would work with? He would be one of the today. ideal person. Yeah. My real people, to be honest, would yeah. be people like Mr. Mark Ronson or um, David Ghetto or somebody like that. Right. Yeah. And um, what else can we expect from you in the future? Well, um, I've started to really do my memoirs for my book. Okay. Um, I have a website, dawnpen.com. I also sell my products on it, like my T-shirts and um, my calendar. But my calendar is the financial year with England. Like it starts 1st April and ends in March. So one is going to come out the 1st of April 2016 for March 2017. Yeah. And of course I have my perfume as well, which I showcase in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. That's Bob lovely. Mars so you're quite Dhabi. busy bunny. Yeah, <laughs> I have to be active. <laughs> and where, where are you performing next? Do you I have any, anything like that? I will be in France um, next month. And I think I have another, I have about two more shows in, in February, to be honest. I have three shows in February. Yeah. Uh, where, where are you going to be performing in February? One is in Bordeaux in mm. France. I don't have at my fingertips the other two. Right. But I have to get my diary. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so before your performances, do you ever get nervous? No, not really. <clears throat> um, it's a way of life. I mean, it's good to see people react. I know there was a time when I was doing a festival in Long Island, Long Beach, California, and a lady came up with a flag. And I don't know what that was, but I was like reading her vibe straight yeah. from the stage. So, yeah. you know, you just can't be distracted and you have to stay focused and make sure everything is correct so that, you know, you don't forget your lyrics or something, mm -hmm. don't break you off track or you lose. Because some artists, they, they prepare themselves or they do something before I they know, go on stage. Do you have anything that you do? No, I just maybe have a cup of tea and I say a prayer, <laughs> that's it. That's nice, yeah. I say it before I reach the venue. Mm. So I already do what You're I'm prepared. supposed to do. Yeah. Uh, how do you handle mistakes during your performances? I just pretend it never happen. It just goes over your head. Yeah, Keep I mean, going. I tried sometimes you know, like you're doing something and, for example, you're doing a PA and you miss the point or whatever. You just um, continue or just break back or say, hold on, pull up, wheel and come again or something like that. Sometimes yeah. it's because the people rail up anyway, yeah, if yeah. they like the song. Yeah. But other than that, it would be something like, 
real and come again or something like that. If 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 I'm singing with a band, for example, I shouldn't be giving this. But come if on, give I'm singing with a band and mm. something is right or I don't feel it at the time, yeah. I would just say wheel and come again and haul and pull mm. up. Or and it gets the like crowd that. jumping though, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, also it can be. Um, what to call it now, adoration or whatever that word is for, um, if they like the track mm, mm. that you're singing, the song yeah. you're singing yeah. and you reel up, yeah. you just yeah. do it over. Well, that's what, it's, it's good Start to have a bit of hype. Yeah, I like that though. When I'm in a, you know, when I'm in a, a concert and they kind of just wheel and pull up, I like that because it even gets your insides racing. You want yeah, more, Yeah, if it's know? something you like yeah. still. Um, describe a real situation that inspired you throughout your career thus far. Hmm. That's a heavy question. What real situation inspired me now? Well, um, there was a time when Jamaica had the independent celebration um, and I played them back up myself yeah. on the piano. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, came, I came second yeah. and, um, you know, I just thought, but at the same time, there was this guy, Tyrone Evans of the Paragon, he's the season of God rest his soul, and he said, um, don't call yourself Dawn Payne, call yourself Conor McGann, okay. because that's so more like a stage name. Mm. So I called myself Conor McGann for that exercise. Did it work for you? Well, I didn't bother with Conor McGann again. No, I, guess. No, I, <laughs> I use my real name. Yeah, why not? I like Dawn Penn. And if you could go back in time, what would you do differently, if anything? Well, if I, I, I would really pay more attention to the business aspect of it. But remember that at the time when we were doing music or at the time we started, people, my close family will cry me down most time. Music was always a business. Yeah. Nobody know that people could make money off singing mm. anywhere. Not even the opera people I see making a living off of singing. Oh, <laughs> like Chai, you know, yeah. like Miss. There was a lady who used to sing and go on stupid like that. But um, yeah, you know, you want to do medicine or you want mm. to do accounting or something. I didn't know that music was a business, but um, it's good that although we had to, whatever there was ups and downs and those hurdles were and we took other vocations to back it up because some people had to become jewelers, some people like mm. Clancy Eagle became a tailor and people like that. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we enriched ourselves to have a second vocation with the music and then the music has really turned around to be the breadwinner. So yeah. had to just stick to that. If you can give up and coming artists some advice, what would that be? Up and coming artist. You have to find out first if you're supposed to be an up and coming artist <laughs> one. <laughs> no, on a serious note, an up and coming mm. artist, yeah? Yeah. Could be someone who is going to be a Mongol in writing words for people to sing. Mm. That's the publishing. That's the major side of the whole thing. Right. Yeah? Now, not everybody can. Some people, if they hear that they will face a stage of 500 people, they lose their nerves. Well, yeah. Some people. I've got nervous just doing the interview but with you. But to be honest, all of us were put here to praise the Most High. Yeah. So whatever way you can do it, and I think whatever you do, try to do it best. Try to do it to the best of your ability because you never know which one might make you shine. Mm. Because music is very well alive and it's a business. So I would say, what would I recommend? Make sure that the administrative end of whatever you do is documented like recorded and also not even recorded they used to talk about posting things to yourself and putting an envelope i can't deal with that kind of mentality <laughs> <laughs> but register the thing i know one time you used to just fill out some forms and you register it with these various bodies and this person gets it that person gets it mm. that person gets it but it's a bit worrying how Somebody can just come out of the blue and just say, oh, I wrote that song, you know, I wrote that song. I know, right? And you could lose out, but I don't know. You just have to be very intelligent and know about, oh, they would say, get a lawyer, get an accountant, and somebody else, a marketing and PR person. But, but sorry, can I say, they know that you can't afford all those things. They know artists can't afford... Well, the lawyers and, I think and, the, and the, the PR thing people. is what help people when yeah. you get signed to someone. Mm. 
Although some people don't want to be signing them more because it's 360 deal not happening like that. Mm. But there is there are rules and regulations to the business that you have to follow. So my son is coming out in the next six months and I'm programming this and it's in the media and it's in the newspaper and it's in everywhere, da 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 and it comes out in good time. Dawn, do you have a message for Don Sinclair about the work he's doing in promoting artists? Um, I must congratulate Mr. Sinclair for this brilliant idea. I knew that there was another person who wanted me to do something, but it didn't turn out as high profile as Mr. Sinclair's situation. And I'm really pleased that I delayed and that I chose this one as the one to be connected with, if you understand my drift. Yeah. So yes, it's good because um, in this arena you need extra things to really go forward and with the social media that's happening right now, um, every little bit helps. Or the more help you can get the better off you'll be in your musical journey. Definitely, because it is a platform for everybody. Right. Thank you very much Dawn. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for watching Don Sinclair Reggae Vibes. I'm your host Leslie Ann Samuel.